much. Um, so I've been. It means there is life. That is, I, I am a Ghanaian Ewenye. Um, so I'm a researcher at the University of Bayoy. Um, I'm looking into elections and to why, when it's election on that day, you leave, especially when you have a nice weather. This way, you still leave everything and you go out to vote. But I'm trying to do that in Ghana, explaining why people go out to vote. Um, but aside that, I've had uh, I have a background in development, in public policy. I've worked also in the development sector. I've worked with GIZ. I've done consultancies, and um, I was very happy when um, we got to hear of the media migrant, the migrant media project, and uh, we I was part of um, my colleagues from Ghana who attended the the workshop. It was very interesting, and I'm glad that we went. The, some of our colleagues, my colleagues, went to the field and uh, had this the training. And I'm here. I'm prepared to learn. I think I'll just go into my speech. I prepared a, an introductory <laughs> remark. So I want to first of all, once again, I want to thank the um, Road Agency for Open Culture and Critical Transformation for this opportunity, mm -hmm. for inviting us here, and for giving me the opportunity to give these introductory remarks to set a tone for the discussion we want to have. I think um, the recent event of the death of some 39, I, I, want to hear, I want to believe you know, the 39 Vietnamese that died in some uh, container in, in, um, in England um, shows that the problem of migration is not just an African problem, but it's a global problem. And um, I think somewhere last week also we had some um, one boat from, I think, Grand Canaries sinking and sinking with it went about 60 migrants so who are actually from Africa and most of them were Gamb um, Gambians. So you can see that irregular migration is accounting for the death of many African, young African men and women outside their home country. And um, I want to believe us all here, we, we are aware of the figures, but I just want to um, create your indulgence to just mention a couple of them. So with the dramatic uh, Dramatic increase in the number of people who migrate between 20, that was between 20, 2014 and 2018. Irregular migration has, in between this period, accounted for more than 30,000 people. With the death of 30, more than 30,000 people, the largest of these losses occurring in the Mediterranean. So, through the num though the numbers actually this year, though the numbers have <coughs> decreased. It is still, irregular migration is still a problem. It's, it's a phenomenon that is still a problem. And I, I, I think it has been at the center of policy interventions. Um, the interventions so far have largely been built on kind of building boundaries, like building entry um, barriers, and as well as built on generalized assumption of the problem. Um, so generating, I believe that generating a sustainable response to the problem of irregular migration, however, would require an evidence-based practical approach. And of critical importance, I think it requires knowing who the migrants are. Um, it is of essence to go beyond just these generalized assumptions of who the migrants are, that these are desperate people, destitute, and they are the poorest of poorest who want to manipulate the asylum systems, especially of our European um, countries. The question is whether the current interventions and policy, both policy and programmatic interventions aimed at um, addressing the irregular migration problem take cognizance of who the migrants are. Are they really, the question I'm asking is, are they really the very poor who are all escaping war and hunger from their home countries? Probably by understanding the background of these migrants, more sustainable and solution-driven approaches can be developed. So I recent, recently, UNDP um, published a report, and um, this report seems to provide some answers to this question. But before I launch into the, the report, I want to share a personal story with you. During my early days here in Germany, around 2009, I think my first day here in Germany was April 1st, 2009, I got to know some of the members of the Ghanaian community in my host um, city, that was in Freiburg. One of them was called Asa. Atta had migrated to Germany. He's a Ghanaian and he had migrated to Germany through one of the irregular routes of the early 2000s and has now naturalized in Germany. Though Atta may come across as someone who comes from a poor background, as most dark skinned people may, um, 
I thought to be. Ata was not that poor. So Ata is actually an indigent of Obuasi. One of the popular, so Obuasi is one of the popular gold mining towns in Ghana. During one of our conversations, he told me how his journey to Germany was facilitated by a middle man, one whose um, service cost him about $5,000. A cost he paid for from his personal savings he made from his mining business. When he told me the amount of money he paid to get to Germany, and for that matter, it is money he made by working in Ghana, I was surprised. Surprised by the fact that he has been able to save such an amount of money working in Ghana, but still felt that he could not have succeeded in Ghana, and as we say it in Ghana, make it big. In many parts, a third story resonates with those of the irregular, those irregular migrants that was captured in the UNDP report. So the report is called Scaling Fence Report. So finding from this report shows that the earnings of almost half of the people who were interviewed, I think they interviewed about, um, 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 I've lost the fact that there were more than 1,000 respondents, more than, close to half, that's 49% of the people were earning, their earnings was competitive when you put it within the, their country context, the earnings were competitive. Meaning that these people were engaged in jobs which were fairly okay and can be described as safe and regular. But it also implies that the other half may, may be struggling. They were actually struggling to make ends meet. So for these 50% embarking on these journeys may be about economics, economic survival, while the other 50 may not really about economic survival. Beyond the role of economic factors in influencing or not influencing the decision to migrate is the desire to secure a better life. At the heart of the story that I shared with you is the dream to succeed. A dream which many feel can only be attained by traveling abroad. So growing up in Ghana, there is a prestige that comes, that is attached to people who have traveled abroad. There's a prestige that comes to being called to be a bugger. So a bugger is a, a word we use in Ghana to describe people who have traveled abroad. And by abroad in Ghanaian terms, we mean people who have traveled to North America and Europe. So where does this associated prestige comes from? I think it comes from the life that the buggers live, the things that they have achieved for themselves and for their family. It is, a life of, it is a life of success, one that is illuminated of the hardships that they face in Europe and in America. These images, however, do not include the menial jobs that they engage in or the fact that many of them could be living without the right documentation. Thus, they do not have access to certain basic services. Services such as I mean, financial services, being able to open a bank account, um, having access to health care, having access to pension, and among others. So the images that these bloggers um, create exclude the narratives of working several jobs and for long hours. Rather, these images create narratives filled with successes. That is to mean one migrates to Europe and in no time starts remitting money home. And in a couple of years, puts up a house and is able to do good for himself and his family. It is the images of these burgers returning home during festive occasions, like Christmas. So very soon, like as it has started now during this season, they'll be wearing flashy clothes with matching accessories, <laughs> driving cars, and actually they speak with assets. So, you know, you need, especially when they come from America, you know, you got a plan, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's these things that kind of motivate and inspire some people to travel by all means and at all costs. It is these images of success that inspire a lot of people to embark on these dangerous migration journeys. Going back to the reports by the UNDP, so about 43% of the people who were interviewed indicated that they have relatives who had migrated. And even for those who had not 
people do not have history of family migration, they do know a family or two in their community who have such migration success stories. And I think the improvement in the last decade, the improvement in internet access, as well as a corresponding rise in the use of social media, has facilitated access to information like never before. As of this year, the global inter uh, internet penetration rate starts at, it stands at, at about 58.8%, and that for the African continent is about 39.6%. At this rate of internet penetration on the continent, with a corresponding social media penetration rate of 17%, the continent is not bad from the, in the influences of social media, the, uh, the social media boom. So on the one hand, this is a positive development because it promotes access to information, among other benefits. But on the other hand, it serves as an avenue for projecting and perpetrating these images. The images are mentioned um, just briefly mentioned one which is fueling the inspirations to travel abroad. So this therefore shows that it speaks to the fact that the, 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 the triggers of migration are complex. It's like there's a complexity of the triggers of migration. It speaks to the fact that the phenomenon is multifaceted. It is one which can be a culmination of inspirations and aspirations, not only in economic terms, but also of the dreams of the individuals to be successful. It also includes the fact that many are oblivious of the life that many of these celebrated bloggers live in Europe. And in particular, many are unaware of the dangers with the use of these dangerous irregular, uh, irregular migration routes. And even for those actually who, who kind of are privy to it and kind of are, are, are informed about the dangers, they just can't relate to it. I mean, they, they just can't think that this really can be that dangerous. They just can't relate to the dangers when it is mentioned. And it is, it is also the case that many do not see the opportunities in their home countries. They have dreams, they have desires to achieve something for, something for themselves and also for their family. But actually, they do not see how these dreams are possible in the current state of their countries. Hence, the need to travel at all costs. This shows that the problem of irregular migration cannot be managed with a one-sided solution. A single-sided approach to tackling irregular migration from Africa would be like one which is built on a single story. And as summarized by the Nigerian novelist, Chine Amanda Adichie, it says single stories create stereotypes. And the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but they are incomplete. So a, from, a framework to tackle the problem of irregular migration from Africa requires a, a combination of approach, approaches. And more importantly, it should be evidence-based. Current interventions have largely focused on building barriers barriers to impede their entry, the entry of these migrants into Europe, as well as into the labor market. Do not get me wrong, I am not advocating that irregular migrants should be given free access to, into Europe and to the labor market in Europe. But even as an African, when I see young, energetic African men and women strolling endlessly in the parks and city centers here in Germany, I get concerned on two levels. So first, these are young, energetic people with dreams and sometimes skills. But for some reasons, they have their productive years being wasted away. Secondly, this is cost to the German taxpayer, whose money is being used to finance the living cost of these irregular migrants without return to the German economy. Hence, it is not surprising to see the uprising of populist sentiment in this regard. I believe it is time for policymakers and relevant stakeholders, both in home and host countries, to find a sustainable solution to this problem. One would ask, where is the motivation for the government on the African continent to want to curb irregular migration? I would want to crave your indulgence to allow me to be a bit cynical here. So after all, 
it is, is it not the case that the fewer numbers that stay on the continent, the fewer job placements will be required to be created by these governments? But that, sh that, but that should not be the case. case. The wasting away of African youth in the Mediterranean, as well as in the parks and city centers in Europe, should be of concern to its leaders. After all, one of the factors that facilitated the development of China is its labor market. The fact that China was able to offer affordable labor to the industrialized world, an incentive which attracted industries, in the, in the, uh, industries to the country, creating the economic boom that we see today, should give insight to the leaders of the African continent. So having their youth wasting away either en route to Europe or in the parks and city squares in Europe should spark concern among them. And for their counterpart in Europe, aside concerns of how to manage a migration crisis, in order not to aggravate the growing population anxiety, there should be the desire to find lasting solutions. A desire I want to believe exists. The question then is what can be done? And I must say that this is not a question I can assume that I know the answer to. Not at all. But based on some of the points raised so far and my knowledge of the context, and I think some of which that my colleagues will be sharing very soon, I can confidently say that an approach to tackling the problem should first and foremost be multi dimensional. And, um, I, and as, as I also, like for instance, so one of the, as I have indicated, most of the migrants, for instance, who embark on these journeys are not necessarily the poorest of poorest, which implies two things. So there is the, the it implies that there is the motivation, the, that is the, the motivation to travel goes beyond just economic inspirations. And it is sometimes has to do with the prestige that comes with traveling abroad. And the perception that one can only make it by travel. So debunking such false narrative is key to reducing the number of people who leave their home countries for Europe. Second, some of these people who leave might reconsider their, their stand if they are well previewed to the opportunities in their home country. Creating an awareness of the alternatives to traveling to Europe is key. As the huge sums of money hitherto being given to smugglers and middlemen can be invested in their home countries. Investments which can create jobs, not only for they themselves, but also for others. In all these solutions, I believe that African diasporas, the Africans who are in the diaspora have a role to play. And that should be strategically recruited into the fight against irregular migration. The above mentioned, I believe, are the bedrock of the Migrant Medium Network project. The project which has so far been piloted in Ghana does not only seek to pay this awareness of the dangers that come to taking the irregular routes to Europe, but also seeks to highlight the importance in the home countries. And of particular relevance to social media, the project seeks to provide young Africans with reliable information not only on safer options to migrate to Europe, but also on the need to scrutinize information on migration that they obtain through social media about their life in Europe. To conclude, I would like to highlight the need for such awareness creation by ending with a quote from one of the participants from the training in Ghana. I read, I am happy I have built some capacity from this workshop. I have learned about migration. We think that traveling outside Ghana alone will make you happy. But because of this workshop, I have come to understand that not just traveling outside Ghana can make me who I want to be in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>